Have you ever wondered what it meant to truly be effeminate from a St. Thomas Aquinas viewpoint? Today, I met live in California with Father Roger Landry to discuss this, to discuss his discernment into the diocesan priesthood and a lot of incredible work that he's involved in. Stay tuned. Thank you for joining us on another episode of The Catholic Gentleman. Today, it's just going to be me, as Sam Guzman is actually speaking at the Chesterton Conference, and I was invited here at Napa Institute to speak to Father Roger Landry. I'm so grateful that I am here. The whole Napa Institute Conference is going to be available online. It's $29 to see uh, just dozens and dozens of incredible talks from Father um, Spitzer to uh, Swiss Guards to just a whole slew of individual individuals such as Father Roger. Roger Landry. And guess what? For the Catholic gentleman, they're giving us a 50% off discount code. So click on that link below, or you can see the discount below. It's going to give you 15% off, 50% off, which means you're going to get this whole thing for $14.50. That's pretty incredible. And so thank you, Napa, for inviting us, the Catholic gentleman, to be here. If this is your first time listening to the episode, please click those subscribe buttons. If you've listened to many, you've enjoyed our memes and our blogs, we'd be grateful for your support, both in prayer and financially. If you are capable and you want to uh, in, be involved in the great movement that we are doing here at The Catholic Gentleman, please head over to catholicgentleman.com support or patreon.com slash catholicgentleman. And you can see different tiers, $5, $10 a month, etc. cetera. Uh, it goes a long way. So I want to thank all of our supporters. And without further ado, Father Roger Landry. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us to another episode of The Catholic Gentleman. We are blessed to be joined by Father Roger Landry, and I'd like to just introduce him right here. So he is a priest of the Diocese of Fall River, Massachusetts. After receiving a biology degree from Harvard College, I went to Yale, so we we'll can fight that out later. Uh, he studied for the priesthood in Maryland, Toronto, and for several years in Rome. After being ordained a Catholic priest of the Diocese of Fall River by Bishop Sean O'Malley on June 26, 1999, he returned to Rome to complete graduate work in moral theology and bioethics at the JP2 Institute or John Paul II Institute for Marriage and Family. He regularly leads pilgrimages to Rome, the Holy Land, Christian, Europe, and other sacred destinations and preaches several retreats a year for bishops, priests, seminarians, religious and lay faithful. He has the papal appointment as a missionary of mercy, and he is one of 56 national Eucharistic ministers or Eucharistic well, preachers. 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 Yeah, not U.S. Ministers. Conference of Catholic Bishops in the three-year Eucharistic revival that God. just initiated in the U.S. Oh, wonderful. And so uh, he'll become, have you become the chaplain of Columbia University yet? Uh, August 1st. I August 1st. Okay, wonderful. And then he's also the founding chaplain of the Thomas Merton Institute, uh, somebody who was very pivotal in my um, growth in my faith and understanding early on. And so, Father, thanks for being here. Good to be with you, John, and with all who follow the program. Yeah, wonderful. And so we always like to talk about, because um, of the thousands and thousands of men that listen to our program, some of them are discerning religious life. So I'd love to start there. I'd love to talk to you and hear your story about why you became a priest. Really happened in two stages. Okay. First was a grace I received when I was four. My mother, who was a very pious Catholic woman, would take my twin brother and me to daily mass. All right. And I looked up and I watched 72-year-old Father John Cantwell, who was going on 172 very wow. fast, and would <laughs> die within a year of multiple oh, wow. health issues. Celebrate mass, say the words of consecration. And I thought if I would were tall enough and uh, to climb up on the altar and peer into the chalice, I'd see human blood and yeah. scabs and everything else, because that's what I thought the mm -hmm. real presence meant at the time. But then I watched him weeble wobble his way down the sanctuary to distribute Holy Communion to those who were old enough and lucky enough to be able to receive Jesus that day. Again, I was four, so several years prior to my first communion. And I thought the wow. priest had to be the luckiest man in the entire universe, capable of holding God in his fingertips and giving them to others. Yeah. Then I watched at the end of Holy Communion, Father Kenwell came over 
to the side altar where the tabernacle was. And that's where Scott and I and my mom were in the front pew. Neil Scott's Scott. your brother. Scott yeah. is my twin, twin brother. brother. And so Father Cantwell put the ciborium with the uh, unused hosts back yeah. in the tabernacle. And then in excruciating pain, knelt down and then had to lift himself up on the maze or the table of that side altar, closed the door. He went back to the main altar to do what we call the purification of the vessels. And I just kept steering at the door because I knew Jesus was right behind that door, mm -hmm. fascinated. And I asked him that day for a priestly vocation so that I'd be able to do what Father Cantwell himself was doing holding God in his hands wow. and having the awesome privilege to feed a hungry world with God himself. So that was the first stage. And that desire for the priesthood never left me in the intervening years. I wanted to be the starting catcher for the Red Sox. I wanted to be a Honestly, professional tennis player. player. I yeah. wanted to be a medical mm -hmm. doctor. I wanted to be a trial attorney. I wanted to be president of the United States. And if not president, at least the kingmaker, <laughs> I wanted to do everything. But the desire for the priesthood never left. But finally, when I became an undergrad in college, I went to Harvard, as you mentioned. And in my first month, I met a priest there who was a priest of Opus Dei. I had never heard yeah. of Opus Dei prior to going to Harvard. And he was a former hockey player for Harvard, good athlete, he had been a lawyer before he was a priest. And he asked me, what do you want to do when you finish Harvard? And so I had been asked that question by many priests, and I would ordinarily be able to make priests blush when I'd say, I'm thinking about becoming one of you. Uh, yeah. Because every priest really does want to pass the baton of course. to somebody else who could continue his work. Mm -hmm. And we pray for priestly vocations all the time. And every occasion in which the Lord puts yeah. someone who's seriously thinking about it in our path, it's always a great joy to have that type of conversation. So I said to this priest, whose name was Father Dave Cavanaugh, I'm thinking about becoming one of you. Yeah. But he was a good poker player. He showed no emotion whatsoever. And he simply asked the question, well, what do you think God wants you to do when you finish? Mm. And as an arrogant 18-year-old freshman at Harvard, I said, well, why wouldn't God want me to be a priest? <laughs> There's a huge need for priests. Mm -hmm. I've lived a moral life. I've worked in a rectory for five years and friends with a lot of priests. Why wouldn't he be calling me to be a priest if, yeah. if the desire is there? And he said, well, so you've lived a good moral life. You've worked for the church. You have a desire to um, do something for God. So why wouldn't he be calling you to be a good husband and father? Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't he be calling you to be a good doctor or lawyer? Why wouldn't he be calling you to be a good businessman and employee? Mm -hmm. Lots this of people could support sparring. their families. Yeah. And it was a checkmate position because prior to that, I thought that just desiring the priesthood was sufficient mm. to say that she had a calling from God to be a priest. And, but I recognized in his question that I had never really discerned it. It was just a desire. Yeah. And I said, well, um, you win. I don't know for sure that God's calling to be a priest wow. just because he's put a desire in for things that are holy do not it does not constitute a vocation so it says well what are you going to do about it and i said ask for your help <laughs> engage in conversations and he smiled and he said now you're talking oh, so good. for the next few years in college i tried to figure out whether god was indeed calling me to be a priest and i was starting to get impatient because either i was going to go into the seminary or i was going to go into medical school okay and i had been accepted into a very prestigious program and I didn't want to keep one of those spots from somebody who would use it. Yeah. Uh, so I, following St. Benedict, who never just prayed for food for his starving monks, but at the end of Lauds, he wanted to go to the gate and find warm buns and milk. Yeah. I asked God very specifically for the first Friday in April of 1992. I said, whether you want me to be a priest or a garbage collector, just tell me. Just, just let me Just know. tell me. <laughs> no. And so I had planned mm. to um, to go to a holy hour that day and have the Lord just tell me what he wanted. Yeah. And I had confidence that he would tell me. But 15 minutes before I was supposed to be at that holy hour, which I had helped to found at Harvard on the first yeah. Friday of the month. Wow. My sister called and said, do you know where your brother Scott is, who was likewise a roommate of mine at Harvard? I said, no, why? 
well, he's supposed to help me to do my taxes. It's funny, she's an accountant now. But uh, I'm here at Harvard Square. I've got a whole bunch of goons checking out my butt, is what she said. Yeah. And you've got to come rescue me. I said, well, Colleen, I have an appointment in 15 minutes. It's really super important. I'm your sister, Raj. <laughs> And so I had to miss the appointment with the Lord Jesus at the mm. Harvard Catholic okay. Student Center Chapel in order to go rescue my baby sister mm. and find my twin brother. There was somebody else who would be present at our Eucharistic generation, so I wasn't okay. really leaving the Lord un, un yeah. vigiled. But later on that night, I met with my spiritual director, expressed my frustration. And he helped me to just see, okay, these are all the seeds that the Lord has planted. Yeah, These are all the paths that he's taken off the table. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that he's calling me to be a priest. Wow. And so I went to the chapel uh, in the place where my spiritual director was and kind of like a ticked off Jew. Mm -hmm. I just was complaining yeah. that the Lord hadn't seemingly kept his end of the deal that I had requested. Right. And I could sense interiorly that the Lord was saying, slow down. Yeah through your spiritual director, for whom you pray to the Holy Spirit, I've just told you A through Z. Yeah. Do you need me to connect the dots any further? Wow. And I, I, I knew that he'd given the answer. I felt immediately a sense of peace and a strength, really, to follow through on the vocation, even though there would be various vicissitudes that would come thereafter. Um, that clear sense that God had been calling me to be a priest was there from April 3rd, 1992. Wow. Wow. That's excellent. And so did you find when you entered into seminary and I, so did you finish Harvard and then go into seminary? Yeah, I finished you, Harvard yeah. And, okay. uh, and went into pre-theology in seminary, uh, did some more philosophy there because I was a biochemist yeah. when I was an undergrad. And so I knew I needed to be able to think in a broader way than just the way a scientist would think. And then I went to Rome for several years for, for theology and, yeah. uh, and had a chance to get to know John Paul II and get to know wow. a lot of seminarians from around the world and some really great influences on my priestly vocation. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. And so um, when you went to Rome or you started in your seminary, were your parents supportive? Did you have any um, further tension or was it pretty much a uh, one? So about 40% decided... of parents oppose okay. their sons or daughters' vocations to be priests or religious, mm. respectively. I was very lucky that yeah. I came from a home that rejoiced, actually, that oh. I would have a priestly vocation. My mom tells a story that on the day of my baptism, the religious sister at our parish was a little superstitious and had this sense that she could divine vocations if the little baptized baby's um, booty fell off, so his little shoe. And mine did fall wow. off, and so she pronounced ex cathedra yeah. <laughs> that I would have a priestly vocation. And so my mom claims from the day of my baptism, mm -hmm. she always knew that I would be a priest. But she's the happiest mom of a priest I've ever known, and so delighted. My dad, because of some of the work I was doing uh, as an undergrad, for which uh, one of the sub-patents for some of the biological research mm -hmm. sold for over a hundred million dollars wow. in a specific geographical reason just ask the simple question well what's going to happen to all that scientific work and i said there are plenty of people who will do it for the money not just for the science don't worry it'll still wow. it'll still happen we've got to do something more important and, and so now so he always supported as well but he did ask that one question of course yeah that's a good question i would ask the same thing uh so what about uh why diocesan and uh, in instead of a religious order or anything like that did that ever enter in so if I could have joined St. Ignatius, St. Francis Xavier, St. Peter Faber in their rooming group back in the 1530s, I would have easily yeah. done it. Mm -hmm. But uh, two factors came. One, I, I was convinced that the diocesan priesthood is where there was the greatest need yeah. for holy priests. Mm. That's where I were, was nourished in the faith, but I didn't really encounter great and inspiring preaching along the way. I saw, because I was looking at the world through the eyes of a future priest from the time I was four, I saw a lot of place for improvement yeah. in, in the way certain priests would hear confessions, mm -hmm. in the way they'd reach out to young people, in the way that they'd handle funerals. I had been an altar boy from the time mm -hmm. I had made my first communion. And so I was hungering to be able to bring uh, uh, real love for those ordinary experiences of what I call retail 
Catholicism yeah, at a parish retail level. Catholicism like uh, religious orders are always specialized. It was funny that when I was applying to the seminary and things like that, so several people would were trying to push me to a religious order, just saying, you know, Roger, you've received a great education. Have you thought about these various religious orders? And I, I said, yeah, I've thought about them. Yeah. But I think that at the parish level, uh, where around which the church really revolves yeah uh, they could use a priest who has received an excellent education yeah and i, I you know I, I look forward to doing that type of work so it was positive that i you know the the, the diocesan priest the parish priest is a general practitioner yeah i like this and system. and so uh i i thought that that was where the greatest need was in order to bring the medicine of the gospel and as St. Ignatius of Antioch called the medicine of immortality, which is the Eucharist, mm -hmm. rather than specialized like a surgeon would be or any of the other sort of more specialized versions of uh, medicine to college campuses or to the particular charisms of these religious orders. And so very happy as a diocesan priest. And I, you know, we diocesan priests have to do it. They have to do something of everything yeah. rather than the specialization. And that's well, that's made me, I, I hope, it's, a well-rounded priest yeah. who has been exposed to what the big issues are in faith and life that some of those in specialized ministries may never encounter. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. And I know a lot of our listeners, uh, when they are discerning, they're they're trying to figure out charisms and etc. And you might be the first diocesan priest we've had. We've definitely had Dominicans and Franciscans and Oratorians and, and things like that. So I appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, so you were in Massachusetts, 1999, you're ordained. And then the scandal broke out a few years later. And I was in Dallas when the scandal broke out. And so I had, you know, I, I younger, but experienced uh, some of that. So how did that uh, affect you? How did you respond to that? Um, was it something that was really close to you because of, you know, being in Massachusetts? And so I grew up in the Archdiocese of Boston, which mm -hmm. was the epicenter yep. on the Feast of the Epiphany, January 6th, 2002. Mm -hmm. um, when the names started to get mentioned and the photos printed in the Boston Globe yeah. uh, during that week, I knew a lot of those priests personally. Wow. Um, one of the biggest abusers had been in my home parish, but had left uh, three years before my twin brother and uh, I became altar boys. Mm -hmm. So averted that just luckily, yeah. but there would have been a lot of pain in the boys ahead of me, uh, of even so. though nobody ever talked about it. And I didn't know any of that stuff at the time, but I began to become aware of just how prevalent it was. Curious for me, because I had been in Rome for many years and was a guide for the Vatican, yeah. the St. Peter's tomb. But then I did a 120 part series for Vatican radio on the various great basilicas in Rome mm -hmm. and took 10,000 people on tours of St. Peter's Basilica, for example, which was really built the new Basilica of St. Peter in response to the counter-reformation. Yeah. And so, so many of the architectural elements in St. Peter's was a result Mm. of the church's response to the criticisms of Martin Luther, John sure. Calvin, and the rest. And so during my formation, I was able to witness in art and architecture the church's response to scandals. Mm. Scandals will always take place yeah. because the devil will be able to be successful in tempting some people away from God toward great sin, including for somebody who lives in Rome for six years, as I did, some of the popes. Yeah. Right. But at the same time, I was able to see how the Lord was always calling saints. And so a month after the scandals broke, uh, it was going to be the fourth Sunday of ordinary time. The Patriots were in the Super Bowl okay. at that time. That was the first Patriots Super Bowl wow, Sunday where the they the won. Legacy, yeah. Yeah. And um, I trained as a moral theologian in mm. Rome. And it was the first time I was going to have a chance to preach on the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are always on All Saints Day, but I was still in Rome on All Saints Day, so I didn't have a chance to preach upon it. And so I was so psyched yeah. that for the only time in my life, I wrote my Sunday homily on a Tuesday. But then over the course of that week, lots of people were just coming up and asking questions about the scandals. Mm. And so at 2.15 on the Saturday, I had to start hearing confessions at three. I just said, I have to preach about the scandals. And so, Thanks be to God, I had played the piano from the time I was three. I can type 140 words a minute. Oh, God. And I banged out yeah. a homily on the scandals. Wow. 
went into the confessional, preached it, and then sent it to 12 friends afterward. And it went what we would now call viral. viral. It was translated in seven different languages. Wow. For six months, I was getting 500 pieces of mail a day. Wow because it was a lifeboat for people who were drowning, not knowing exactly what could occur, mm. um, what they should do for that uh, in response to the scandals. And in it, you know, I, I basically talked about three different episodes, Jesus calling the 12, all of whom betrayed him. Yeah. But then also Judas was among the original 12, mm. but we are here because of the fidelity of the other 11 after their betrayal. Yeah. And so built into the Apostolic College was Jesus's choice after praying all night to the Father and one of them betrayed. And then I mentioned two other stories that were really quite powerful. St. Francis de Sales, mm. who helped to bring back a whole region mm. of Eastern France from the Calvinists, yeah. uh, the Chablais region of, of France and Geneva. Um, and he wrote in his intro, to his Catholic controversies, a bunch of apologetic works that as terrible as scandals are, which are the spiritual equivalent of murdering somebody's soul. Yeah. What's worse is when we take scandal because that's the equivalent of spiritual suicide. Mm -hmm. And he urged the Christians of his day not to cut themselves off from the sacraments, but to remain faithful to Christ who has never been unfaithful to us, even though some of his ministers have been unfaithful. And then I likewise used the dialogue that one of the young Franciscans had with St. Francis, mm. where, again, in the 13th century, there were a lot of priests living in open scandal. Yeah. And so one of the young Franciscans asked St. Francis, what would you do if you knew that priest was having an affair with a woman? Yeah. And St. Francis said, I would go and receive our Lord Jesus from the priest's anointed hands. Mm just again, focused on what we would call ex opere operato in the faith, that despite the unworthiness of a minister, if the minister intends to do what the church intends yeah. and is validly ordained and prays the words, it's still Jesus Christ mm. under the appearances of bread and wine, even if the priest were in the state of mortal sin. And so that homily went everywhere and um, lots of bishops ended up using it for their chrism mass. I was blown away by what the Lord did when I gave him five loaves and two fish, how we fed yeah. a multitude all across the world. And every subsequent time when a scandal hit Ireland, when a scandal hit Germany, all of a sudden, yeah. everybody would be going back and it'd be getting okay. hundreds wow. of reprint requests for what I had done there in 2002. The other aspect of it, which has thoroughly influenced my entire priesthood is Lots of those who were survivors of priestly sexual abuse were calling me mm. and just saying, you know, I was touched, but I've got a lot of questions and I'm so confused by what right. you said. Could we talk? And sometimes it would be two or three hour conversations. And what was very moving to me was I had the privilege to apologize to them on behalf of Jesus Christ, who sent out priests not to abuse, but to die yeah. for those um, entrusted to them and, um, and to try to indicate to them uh, what their priesthood really is rather than the horror stories that they had encountered. And so to be uh, an instrument to say sorry and help reconcile a handful of those who had suffered what should never have been endured um, is one of the great graces of my life. And wow. over the intervening 20 years, um, I've had many other opportunities to be present for those who have suffered from the church in this way. And that uh, advanced placement schooling that yeah. I received back in 2002 yeah. as a result of this has, um, has helped a great deal in, in knowing how to approach the people who have uh, seen the worst of the church and likewise know what they need to see from the church today yeah. to give it a second shot. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing that. I really appreciate it. It was actually not at all part of my <laughs> uh, plans for this episode, but that means a lot. I really appreciate you sharing that. We'll find a copy of that and, and drop it in the show notes. Yeah, February February uh, 4th, 3rd and 4th, yeah. 2002 for catholicpreaching.com. Oh, catholicpreaching.com. Yeah, well, we'll we'll include that in the show notes as well. So um, 
goodness. This uh, year, you started talking about moral theology. St. Alphonsus is one of my favorite saints. Um, but uh, I, since this is uh, episode geared towards men and helping men grow in holiness, embrace the call to sanctity uh, today, I'd like to shift that a little bit. And I'd like to talk to you briefly about what do you feel are some of the biggest challenges um, facing men today? In fact, maybe we do it like this. I know that you wrote um, a, a short little treatise or booklet uh, for the Knights of Columbus. What inspired you to start writing for men and helping men? Because you've written a lot for men that are really called to men in the heart of men. Um, you talk about virtues and everything like that. Um, you know, we on the show talk about archetypes and we talk about virtues and things like that. So I guess maybe going forward with this direction of your life, what started inspiring you to, you know, calling men to something greater than, than the junk that they were seeing on TV or, you know, pornography and all that stuff that was. When I grew up, I was a jock. Okay. And so I had some good coaches and some bad coaches, mm. but I coached basketball for nine years. I was a collegiate tennis player and mm. coached many in tennis. And, um, and I recognized going on up that in many places, there was a deficiency in real care for men. Mm. Women were dominating the parishes yeah. with yeah. all the volunteer opportunities and everything else. And frankly, a lot of priests were effeminate mm -hmm. and effeminate priests, I don't think serve any group of people well, except women who are very needy, just yeah. that subclass of people. Um, strong women, not to mention most guys, do not appreciate effeminate male leadership. And so there was a huge vacuum there that I didn't go in wanting to give particular theological formation for men. I just really wanted to demonstrate yeah. a manly way of living the priesthood. I mean, in the church militant yeah thank you yeah you know, nice. like a good priest yeah. is a combination of a wise general mm. and a very courageous sergeant i love it and mm. to combine both of those together was something that i just wanted to flesh mm. rather than necessarily preaching anything from a pulpit i just wanted by my body Lead language that. to yeah. manifest it but I wrote that booklet for the what became for the Knights of Columbus yeah. because I was asked by this organization called the World Youth Alliance in 2002. Yeah. Yeah. They were hosting a huge event at the World Youth Day in Toronto, 2003, excuse okay. me, with John Paul II. And I had to write it on a gymnasium floor, mm -hmm. which is where all the pilgrims I had brought from uh, my parish in Fall River were uh, in Toronto. So I wrote it at 5 a.m. on a gym floor, gave it. There were 4,000 people at this World Youth Day wow. event by the World Youth Alliance. And uh, Janet Smith was one of the uh, Janet people Smith, likewise absolutely, speaking. Yeah. And at the very end of it, she said, that's one of the finest things I've ever seen about a practical, what I call theological andrology yeah. so what it means to be a man andros is the greek word for man yeah. mm -hmm. not just human person but male human beings um from the perspective of god what god says about manhood but then what authentic manhood says about god who's created yes us male and female and what the dimension of jesus's masculinity would mean for us or saint joseph or i likewise in that um talked about the virtues of a soldier yeah and how that is meant to influence the way males approach human life and the big and the small choices. So I did that and received a lot of encouragement. And I began to recognize by the response to that speech, mm -hmm. just how hungry people were for what was in the speech. I was approached by the Knights afterward to see if I could rework it into one of their booklets. And okay. it's just been reprinted over and over and over and yeah, over exactly. again since. Um, so that's where that started. And then uh, with my identical twin brother, we helped to found the Boston Catholic Men's Conference Good. and saw that huge hunger again that we yes. had 8,000 guys in the middle of winter He's to done. a conference at the new Boston Convention Center, men's conferences across the country, lots of retreat work for seminarians mm -hmm. and uh, clergy, yeah. in which part of what we need to do in formation today is to just make sure that we focus on God's calling us as men. Mm, exactly. You know, what does it mean that he's called only men? Mm. It's a mystery. We're not better than women. That's right. 
but just like Jesus incarnated as a man. Yeah. So his priesthood is incarnated in a man. And so what dimensions will that assume, especially in our spiritual fatherhood? Yeah. And, you know, with so many of the scandals, which we were talking about before, but every other aspect, when we take our fatherhood seriously, most of the problems that would lead to the scandals disappear. Yes. I preach mm. to seminarians all the time. Like you are a spiritual father, which means yeah. you cannot have a sexual relationship with anybody entrusted to you that is not by definition incestuous. Mm. Raise your hands if you're turned on by incest. Most of us are revolted. Yes. Most absolutely. of us would vomit. Yeah. Uh, and you know, as a priest confessor, mm -hmm. over the course of my 23 years as a priest, Occasionally, we'll have dads come on in. As soon as their daughters reach a certain age, yeah, they catch themselves with a little bit of a lustful eye just for a second, yeah. seeing their teenage daughter get out of the shower or put the clothes on. And they are so sickened that those confessions, when they come, are really deeply profound. That this is where some grown men, dads, yeah, wow. are convicted about their lust because even for a very short period of time, they began to look at their own flesh, wow. at their daughter in a fallen way. I've never way. heard this. Mm. And so like they've come and it's really been a profound conversion for them. And what I try to convey to, to priests and to future priests is everyone entrusted, that Brazilian supermodel, mm. that yeah. broken parishioner whose husband has just beaten her and abandoned her and everything else, that you're trying to just say, no, you're not yeah. that insulted Object. figure yeah, exactly. that uh, he's pretended you are, et cetera, that in every single circumstance, that's a spiritual daughter. Wow. And if you wouldn't be attracted to incest naturally, supernaturally, you shouldn't be either. Yeah, amen. But when we start to assume the virtues of fatherhood, so protecting, yes, providing, being a wise counselor. Yeah. Um, mm. when, we, when we start to take on some of those roles, then our priesthood is really going to come alive. We do have to protect our spiritual children, even if they're the age of our great-great-grandparents, yeah. from the evil one and from the various ways that the evil one insinuates himself into our culture. We have to provide. That means we have to work really hard. The priests who... Um, look at their priesthood as a career and who look mm. ahead to their days off and, and their vacations too much, miss the essence of the fatherhood of a priest where you're a full-time dad yeah. for the entirety of your life. And like, there are no days off from your fatherhood, even if you're going to have certain days where you're not technically on duty. Yeah. If uh, something summons you on that day, You've got to respond in the same way that any natural dad would if he were on a Saturday or a Sunday, but a child needed help. Yeah, exactly. Um, in, in, the, in the wisdom, you know, that, that real dads um, help their sons and daughters enter the world wisely, yes. not in an imprudent way, not taking idiotic risks, mm. but to be able to say, don't be afraid. Let's get out there. You can do it. Literally encouraging, mm. infusing your children with with the courage that's needed to confront their fears and going out there that a good spiritual dad will do that in his parish the same way that a good dad will do it in his home. Yeah. And so to try to live that, because if you're not in fleshing it, everybody recognizes you're a hypocrite. That's right. And then to articulate it in, in ways that will inspire priests and future priests to correspond to the masculine identity that God has given them that he really wants to unleash in their priesthood has been one of the funnest and coolest aspects of my last 23 years. Oh, I love it. I'd like to take a step back and I'd like for you to help us define effeminacy because it, I think it takes many different colors today. I know I've certainly heard it. I know that... Um, Thomas Aquinas described it one way that's very different than how maybe uh, our listeners or at least myself um, a year ago or so, you know, really kind of understood it. So if you could um, describe a feminacy and, and maybe even, and I know that you're prone to do this because I've read some of your stuff, uh, you know, about the, the lack of virtues and lack of control and things like that. Because I feel like I know that when I hear you talk about effeminacy or you talk or St. Thomas Aquinas or somebody, um, you know, of that nature talk about it. It's, it's, it is repulsive. And it's something that 
we as men don't want, you know? And so if you wouldn't mind, I, I'd appreciate hearing. So when normally in English, when we think about effeminacy, yeah. we more or less think that it, it means men behaving as women. women. Yes. That's not what the way Thomas talked about it. The term he used in Latin was militia. Militia meant a softness, a weakness. So feminine women can be awesome mother beers, yeah. extremely courageous, but very feminine women can or might not be effeminate mm. if they're just really weak and helpless and poor things. Yeah. Men who are effeminate are not necessarily feminine, mm. but their virtue has more or less been sucked out of them so that they're what they're doing is they're behaving in a way in which they're making excuses for the completion of their duty because they just don't think they have it in them mm. and for us as christians we can do all things and god who strengthens us yeah a lot of times we're going to have to ask him for the help and, we're going to be able to do it, mm. and just do the best job that we can but there's a real softness there's a weakness that comes from an egocentrism where we begin to think about ourselves think about our needs, think about our desires, think about our wounds yeah. more than we're thinking about God and others. Mm. And so, for example, in basic training, Terry, yeah. there would be some guys who come in who might be a little bit soft, but part of the training is to make you strong, to recognize your weaknesses with humility, mm. but to be trained through the weaknesses so that your external behaviors are strong. Yeah. And eventually, once you start behaving in that way, it has a cycle back to make your character actually stronger. Yes. Because deeds of courage lead to a courageous character, lead to the formation of that habit. And so some people would define militia, this softness, this effeminacy as a real lack of courage. Yeah, lack of courage. And so you see that sometimes in the priesthood um, where people just buckle before the types of challenges. In the pulpit, for example, of preaching faithfully to the church in a way that's pure, but a way that's serpentine sagacious. Yeah. It was wise as a serpent, as pure as a dove on issues in which the devil is strangling our own people. Yeah. Um, so you'll see it there. You'll see it in terms of confronting situations that need to be confronted in a parish where you need to be a peacemaker in that parish and it, different segments of your parish or different individuals are not reconciling with each other. You can't ignore that or just entrust it to somebody else. You have to go into the breach there. Yeah. Um, there are lots of ways that you can develop the masculine strength of character for which effeminacy is both the defect of masculinity yeah. as well as the defect of authentic femininity mm -hmm. because masculinity and femininity are real strengths Amen. made that way by God to protect and provide and ultimately to love in the way God has made us to love, the way that he taught us to lay down our lives for others. Men and women may do that in different ways, but there is a total self-gift that's involved in the perfection of our character mm. for which effeminacy is its opposite. I like that. I appreciate you sharing that. Hopefully our listeners get a lot. Um, uh, we, okay, so <clears throat> we got about 15 minutes left. And so I want to use this time to start talking a little bit about um, Practical guidance, where you feel like men can really need to work on. I mean, so we're talking about effeminacy, and my mind immediately goes to asceticism, right? <laughs> and I know that we can commune with Christ and grow in holiness. Um, we had Father David Abernathy on, who talked about the beauty of asceticism. And our, and, but, but from your standpoint, you mentioned a couple things already, right? Provider, protector, you know, um, how can single man, um, single men, how can married men practically start growing in in masculinity? And if you need to prime us before you get to those solutions. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd start that the whole point of human life, we've been made by God who is love, mm. in love and for love. And there's a masculine way to love. Cardinal Angelo Scola, who was one of my professors in Rome, interpreted St. John Paul II's Theology of the Body in, I think, a very beautiful and consistent way with it, in which he said men and women love differently mm -hmm. men receive love by giving love and women give love by receiving love 
he gave up two things. First, biologically, the whole way yeah. our reproductive system works is women receive and men yeah. are external. Yeah. But even if you look at those doors that you could either push open or pull, yeah. the vast majority of men in every culture, 80% push the door. The vast majority of women pull the door. Now, it's not like when you've got fraternal twins of boy and a girl yeah did you say now you're a girl so you're going to pull the door you're a guy you're going to push the door <laughs> right but that was part of it mm. um, built into us as a way of engaging the world likewise if you just give a two-year-old boy two-year-old girl a set of blocks just to play with yeah most guys are going to build towers until they fall over right most women not most girls are going to build a little harbor and put a block in the middle of it it's like, so So there are some deep yeah. psychological differences that you can see between men and women um, in the way that we approach the whole world as love. So what does it mean for a man uh, to be able to love as a man? Hmm. He's got to be a self-giver. He's got to be a self-sacrificer. It's not when we talk about asceticism, yeah. self-sacrifice, et cetera. A lot of guys can say, what do I have to give up? Sure. And sure, we have to cut off certain things that are toxic hmm. to us. But I think the most important part of asceticism is what are we going to be doing positively? Our Christian life is not fundamentally the fight against sin. Mm -hmm. Our Christian life is the fight to love as we have been loved and as Christ calls us to love. Mm -hmm. And that goes way beyond not sinning. Mm -hmm. And so for us, I think one of the biggest issues I try to face is the cowardice of men to go from girlfriends to spouses mm. i've been working for the last seven years in manhattan yeah there are a lot of gifted guys in manhattan superstars in the workplace but in they'll date and they'll be very generous and they'll take lots of women on out but they'll be dating for two years uh -huh. two and a half years three years they enjoy the company but this woman is praying yeah for a proposal to happen but a lot of the guys are too timid to actually propose some of them have used the image that like in business, I control every circum circumstance. But if I'm going to propose, it's like I'm taking my heart and put it in a blender mm -hmm. and just praying that she doesn't press start. Yeah. As if it's going to be just sort it's of that cowardice. Like, yeah, tor torn up. And listen, for, for, for guys, for us to give life, we need to be able to take the risk of rejection. Yes. Just as Christ did. Christ was that grain of wheat who fell to the ground and died. And some of the soil on which that grain of wheat would fall would be what he calls stubborn, rocky, and thorny. Yeah. Not necessarily fruitful soil, but he did it. And then he says to us with a calloused and pierced hand, guys, I want you to follow me. Come follow me. Lay down your life this way. And so I think today, one, this wasn't an issue 50 years ago. It wasn't an issue throughout history. But it's a particular issue today that I think comes from pornography. Yep. It comes from other manifestations of lust. Mm -hmm. And it comes from a culture, basically, in which authentically masculine virtues have been treated as vices. Yeah. Um, where the Shunt model vices. male that you're going to see on a television sitcom, for example, is going to be a very, very weak guy yeah. who's Not feminine. Yeah, who's basically bossed around by women mm -hmm. and everything that he seeks to do is to please women rather than die for women yeah. and really serve women, sometimes by masculine leadership, sometimes by being a true gentleman. And just making sure she's got everything she needs mm -hmm. to try to please. But that that habit that we have today of not being able to make a lifetime commitment, whether it's to the sacrament of marriage, whether it's to the sacrament of priesthood, whether it's to religious life, you name it, that's a huge problem today. And there are a lot of virtues that allow us to be able to give of ourselves to others. And there are a lot of vices that weaken us. Um, toward that total self-giving. And so the first one I talk about, because I think it's the great crisis in the church today, is courage. And men are called to receive that gift from the Holy Spirit and exercise it for everybody. Yeah. Um, courage. Jesus was incredibly courageous. I think one of the reasons why he chose Peter to be the prince of the apostles was that Peter was the, the person who could be first mm -hmm. when Jesus said, who do you say that I am? The first to jump out of the boat and rush to Jesus yeah. at Jesus' bidding, the first 
to say, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We've come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. When Jesus was asking him, would you two leave me on account of the Holy Eucharist? So part of masculinity is to be courageous in that way, to be mm. the first if we have to be the first. Right. There, there are others. Do we, do we have the courage to be honest with people? Do we have the courage to be honest with ourselves and go to confession? Do we have the courage to align our life to the pearl of great price that we receive in God? Or do we constantly try to keep our options open, which is a, which is a form of cowardice? We could go on, but um, the monologue wouldn't happen. I love it. I uh, know we could dissect all of those and we'll have to have you on. I know that you um, you are speaking to, uh, on courage and stuff like that. You're doing the Edify series, isn't that right? And um, and some other things. And so um, I'll finish with my final question because you brought it up and you're a Eucharistic preacher here for the Eucharistic Revival. So I want to give you an opportunity to talk about that to our men. Um, we'll have thousands and thousands of men that will listen to this. And um, and and I'd love for you to just speak to their heart and, and why falling in love with Christ in the Eucharist and why being there courageously to uh, defend him and take, you know, protect him, but also to receive him worthily are so important. And I'd love for you to just uh, share what you'll be doing and and you know what you want men to understand so it's it's a fitting wrap up for everything yeah. we've talked about like for us to become really strong men mm. we're able to enter through the awesome gift of holy communion into communion with jesus mm. and his self-giving not just his self-gift two thousand years ago his perpetual self-giving if there's any way we become more who he's created to be more courageous more wise more loving ultimately it is by entering into communion with the greatest love of all in which jesus gives himself so the eucharist first in the participation in mass and really giving the lord the cooperation to change our life you know many of us take two advil knowing that it's going to change us on the inside if we have a headache it's going to remove right. a headache most of us don't even approach holy communion with that, that sense that it's right. going to change us. So mass. Second is, if we really want to become Eucharistic disciples of the Lord Jesus, the best way we do that is through Eucharistic adoration. Um, where, like, we don't kneel before bread boxes. No. But we do kneel before the Lord. And so a lot of guys are afraid because we're, for the most part, active. Mm. What do we do in Eucharistic adoration? We start to squirm a little bit if we're going to kneel or sit anywhere except on a lazy Ouch. boy on a Sunday yeah. before our favorite football game, yeah. right? But for most of us, it requires some courage to be able to learn how to be quiet before the Lord. But I'd strongly urge guys to be manly with regard to going for a converse with the King of Kings, especially in parishes that want to start long periods of Eucharistic adoration, especially perpetual around the night. I said to the Knights of Columbus, for example, in one of my parishes, many of you are veterans, you'd be a sentinel on the night shift for the country. Mm -hmm. Do you have the courage and the love to be able to do that for Jesus so wow. that this can really happen? We can't send the nine-year-old women for the 2 a.m. shift. That's right. It's a time for men to step up and you'll become greater Eucharistic disciples if you do it. And then, to become greater Eucharistic apostles, mm. to start Eucharistic processions. Wow. It requires great organization, the types of things guys are good at, but we also have to have guys carrying canopies. We also have to have guys who are working with the police in order to be able yeah. to police escorts, exactly. you name it. Yeah. But like when we start to take Jesus out into the streets and say, I'm not ashamed of my faith in the Lord Jesus, it starts to change us in the inside. And it makes so much easier for us to be able to talk to a brother, to talk to a friend, to talk to a colleague at work, like about the gift of Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. Just even participating, walking with Jesus out into the streets is awesome a gift that that is. It changes us into Eucharistic missionaries. Yeah. And so like those threefold things can really help us as Catholic men, receiving Jesus and entering into his courageous and perpetual self-giving. Yeah. Second, to fall on our knees before him, to receive whatever he wants to give us in Eucharistic adoration, because we ultimately become like the one we adore. Mm. And third, to take Jesus out into the streets, which will help us to take Jesus across the road to all those who in the parable of Good Samaritan are left in the spiritual ditches of the world, yeah. 
who really need to be picked up, cared for, and taken to the end of the church. And so this is really where the Eucharistic revival is going. And in order for it to be successful, it just can't be the women with blue and white here right. leading it. It's got to be men who have barbers like I have, God, yeah. or, you know, I mean, with, with, we need men to yeah. be part of this Eucharistic revival. And if the Eucharistic revival is going to be successful, men are not just going to have to be participants in it, but use their masculine leadership in it. And so I'd like to challenge everyone listening to this program not to think, as I sometimes get when I write articles on it about the Eucharistic revival. Well, for the Eucharistic revival to be successful, we have to have ad orientum worship or yeah. greater access to the traditional Latin mass or priests have got to give Holy Communion more on the tongue or you name it. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of suggestions which are fine and there's truth to every one of these suggestions. But the Eucharistic revival is not just supposed to be parochial, yeah. not just supposed to be diocesan, not just supposed to be national, not just supposed to be liturgical. The most important part of this is personal. And so rather than looking at all the other things that need to change outside of me, I'd just like to challenge everybody who's listening to us today or watching us to say, how can my life become more Eucharistic? Because if my life becomes more Eucharistic, it's certainly going to be more manly, and it's going to be the type of life that when we're facing the Lord at the end of our time here on earth, we're going to say, I didn't waste it because I learned from you how to be like you, and that's the purpose of why we're here. Wow. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate that, and and just uh, such wisdom. So I am grateful. We'll put a bunch of these links and everything like that in the show notes. Um, where can men find you? I can throw those in the show notes as well. Yeah, I just urge pretty much everything I do, I upload to a site my twin brother built me back in 2005 mm -hmm. called catholicpreaching.com. And if you go there and just type in manhood or manliness or fatherhood, you'll get pretty much everything that I've preached to bishops, priests, seminarians, men's conferences, et cetera, over the course of, of my 23 years as priest. Um, that's one of the, I'll just, if, if we've got one minute, John. We've got plenty of time, yeah. Um, one of the problems in the church is because there's a deficit of manliness in priests. Yeah. Sometimes men go for false prophets who are just manly, but are gonna lead them over a cliff. Mm. It's a summons for priests who are truly faithful rather than egocentric, who are real men of God and men of the church. It's a challenge for there to be more of that. I've always aspired to do that. And so on there, I think that there's um, solid meat for male spiritual carnivores. Yeah. And so I'd encourage them to get their knife and fork out and love it start chewing. We have to do that. Absolutely. So I want to take a moment. I want to thank Napa for bringing us together. I want to thank you for being here. Great to be with you, John. Yeah, it means a lot. And as we end each of our episodes, men, remember, be a man, be a saint.